so before I really, uh, you know, take the risk uh, tips from uh, Sabya Sashi, I would want Mukund, if you can give some insights into some of the uh, innovative products that you were talking about and how you would want the developers to really get ready to raise some of this uh, equity that you were talking about or the corporate uh, debt that you were talking about. So please give us some insights there. Thanks, Sanjeev. Um, you know, clearly, when you're kind of looking at, uh, you know, one is, of course, to attract a private investor in, and I think Amit has given a good insight into what private investors look for. Uh, the second is more in terms of what are the public market options that today the renewable industry in India has. Um, I know we touched upon Invits, so Sanjeev, we did. Um, but unfortunately, Invits, the two things that kind of have gone against it, and both of them have to do with history. One, uh, the biggest invent that was there in the world, uh, Terraform, which was under Sun Edison, uh, obviously did not set a great example for how invents, either in terms of management or in terms of performance. And that's obviously has a bit of, bit of an overhang. Uh, second, if you really look at our Indian invents, uh, both the road and the transmission invents that have come out till now, unfortunately, the post issuance performance has not been, uh, of course, it's pretty short term. It's not yet, uh, you know, it's not that long, but the post issuance performance has not been very good. And that obviously puts people away from invits. Personally, I think invits for the renewable sector as such is probably uh, less attractive than say invits for uh, road and uh, and even transmission and utilities. The reason being, renewable is normally fixed tariffs. Um, if anything, declining um, declining uh, you know declining production because of uh, your know, degradation of panels and. You, you probably have less cash available going forward than more cash. What an equity investor looks for, which is what an equity investor is, is for growth. And the growth can be obtained only by adding in more and more assets into it. So it in effect becomes a capital raising and a, and a asset increase play rather than growth coming from the existing pool of assets. Technically, in which in either transmission or road come from existing pool because if anything, you at least have an increase in tariff or increase in toll as per CPI and as per the inflation rates. So that's one reason why I think renewable inwards probably is not the way forward. If you look at one of our large Indian players, they've rather chosen the way of going through an IPO route. Um, not at all tried and tested, but I think in the next few months, we will see at least one come out into the market. Um, it would be a very interesting thing to see how well it performs, how well investor reception is, because that will set the precedent for other players to come into the market and uh, go through the IPO route. As Meanwhile, what we're seeing is, um, you know, more innovative instruments. I think this is really coming from a, from the ideas of what yield codes are supposed to be. Uh, yield codes are basically, you know, equity style investment, but as actually more for a risk free debt style or low risk debt style return. So it's more like a debt type of return. Um, what, what, in fact, DB was at the forefront of this a few years ago when you put together uh, the ideas from the yield co and help a few of our Indian issuers with large platforms to go and raise money in the international markets that will help them refinance the existing debt. What is the value in refinancing it? The value is that you can actually raise money and get an incremental growth capital out there which can be used for new projects. So if you have $100 of, uh, of capital invested in, say $30 of equity and $70 of debt, you can actually refinance the $70 post construction, post stabilization through an offshore bond issuance and raise an hundred dollars in the back of the same assets. What that really means is remaining 30 is really available for new projects going forward. Why does this work? The reason being international investors look at uh, renewable assets quite differently. Rather than looking at it as just, uh, rather than kind of sizing it up and looking at an amortizing kind of uh, loan profile, they look at shorter term, relatively five, seven years, uh, but more bullet style repayments. Bullet style repayments and also the repay, the sizing of the debt is more a function of the EBITDA. Given the stable kind of, you know, uh, generation that we see on renewable assets, uh, they look at EBITDA of say five and a half times uh, EBITDA, which comes to almost 100% of the project cost. That's the reason why I've seen quite a few issues has come out in the market. Greenco, um, Azure, Renew, three different companies, very different profiles. One was, a, uh, you know, solar, wind and hydro, uh, hydro portfolio. The other was a mostly wind portfolio, but interestingly raises money through an orphan SPV structure uh, that was renew. And third is Azure, which has actually gone out into the market with, uh, with essentially a pure solar portfolio and has raised money out there. 
They managed to raise money at very attractive rates. Um, Renew was at six percent. Greenco, the first bond was at eight and eight and a half. The second bond was at four point eight seven five. Obviously, international markets have got more used to it. Um, there's a lot more demand for Indian credits, um, and you saw even Azure go down to the mar market and raise money at five and a half. Two things out here. Uh, one, you know, Azure's bond, which was raised at five and a half, is today trading at four seventy. What does it mean? It means that one, investors are very happy with it because the returns have been stupendously large. Um, second, it means if Azure today goes back into the market to raise money, they won't be able to raise money at, at those levels. And that's where the that's where the uh, you know the attractiveness of this market is. The second important thing out here is the two key risks in this kind of issuance, right? One is it's a five-year kind of financing or seven-year financing. It's not a 20, 25-year financing. So clearly there is a refinancing risk. And I think all these issuers are aware of that. All these issuers have strategies around that. And we have already seen a good example of Greenco having gone and actually refinanced one of the earlier bonds. So there is a precedent also to that. The second risk that you're seeing uh, that we have clearly is the FX risk. Um, money is raised in US dollars, returns are all in rupees. Rupee can, I mean, rupee has depreciated at times significantly in a year on year. Uh, but on an average about 3%. But just keeping it open is probably not the best approach at all. It exposes you to un, you know, exposes you to an unacceptable level of risk. What has happened is the markets, international markets have actually able to provide, rather than full hedges where you kind of leave a lot more money on the table, you pay a much larger hedging cost, to actually do hedges that are more like in the nature of a call spread, option structures. Still mitigates a significant part of the risk but is at much lower cost. So we look at the landed cost of some of the new bond issues that are happening, they are in the range of nine, nine and a half percent. So at nine and a half percent, you're able to refinance your existing entertainments and you're able to raise incremental equity for new projects. And that's where, that's where the value really is. Of course, this is not going to be the only vehicle available, right? This is more, I would say from an established platform, a more stop gap way of raising money. Uh, while we, you know, while any platform will still have to look at equity investors if they really want to grow. Great. Uh, I think uh, so many options with uh, the risks alongside and uh, I'm sure the entire composite perspective, what you brought out will be very, very useful to all the uh, developers present here. But that brings me actually to the key thing, the risk, which is where Sabya Sashi is an expert on and if you can give us perspective on the risks that have been brought out, especially to this international fundraising and also to the others that you wanted to add on at that moment on the project and uh, generally on the financing part. Please, Sabi Sashi. See, on the project side, uh, I mean, uh, let's uh, ignore for the time being the financing aspect. From the project side, where do we see the risk coming from? Uh, one is, of course, on the operating performance, let's say, since we are focusing on solar, operating performance, of course, is there. So it really is a question of, you know, what kind of module suppliers you have gone to. I mean, for cutting down on the costs or minimizing the costs, have you gone for really not the best quality of modules or the best quality of inverters and other equipment? So the question is, have you gone in for the best quality of equipment? That would be a major factor uh, of course whether they have done so or not only you know uh, time will tell us second of course there is the natural degradation factor that 0.7 or 0.5 percent whatever they talk about uh, of course since indian plants don't have a long enough operating track record we have to be slightly mindful of that but again, you know, we have some data for our own rated portfolio for over four to five years and internationally also data is available. And by and large, what we feel is that whatever degradation and other things are taking place, they are well within what was originally budgeted. So at least till now, we have not got any negative surprises on that. Uh, third, of course, uh, major factor, of course, will be, you know, off taker behavior. Now, we have to look at, you know, various assets which are in play right now. There would be players, let's say, who would have set up under the original Gujarat scheme where, uh, you know, they had set up under 15 rupees. 
Now clearly when you are able to get incremental solar power at 2 rupee 40, 2 rupee 50 paise. So 15 rupees, even 4 rupee 40 paisa, which we thought was, uh, you know, really, you know, very low whether projects will be viable or not. Even 430 would seem to be, in fact, we are told that even on 315, you know, there are people who are saying, why should we sign now at 315? So that risk remains. Having said that, of course, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's a question of whether we believe, uh, you know, PPS are sacrosanct or not. And increasingly, although, of course, a lot of challenges are being placed from the regulator side, from the court side, as well as increasingly from the central government side, the message that we are trying to get is that, no, you cannot unilaterally walk out of contracts whether it's favorable to the off-taker or whether you are favorable to the generator. For example, in the case of the Gujarat uh, solar PPS, they did try to get out of it. Eventually, the uh, regulator said, no, you can't uh, just walk out of it. Similarly, on the other side, there was this coal. I mean, uh, on the coal side, we saw that a couple of entities had uh, argued that uh, the increase in coal prices and taxation internationally was a force majeure event and they should be compensated. Again, the Supreme Court finally did rule in favor of the original contract. So, to be fair to the courts and regulators, they do, do seem to be uh, giving the message that uh, contracts cannot be renegotiated, renegotiated uh, unilaterally unless you are able to demonstrate that there was some, uh, you know, malafide in the way it was signed or not. And government is also now increasingly, we heard just the other day from Karnataka government that they have said that with the condition of the plant being, uh, you know, implemented by 31st March has been there. It's now a question of whether the regulator just has to give a stamp to it. He cannot, uh, you know, insist on opening it. So at least on that, we are seeing some favorable noises. Uh, let's hope that it ultimately gets, because ultimately the discoms have to honor that. Let's hope that over the six months we get a clarity on that. But definitely, I think, on off taker, if we get a clarity on that, that will be very helpful. The second side, of course, related to that is also the back down risk. Uh, although, of course, unilateral PPAs, whatever uh, you know, we can make out, uh, walking out of that will not be possible. There's always a possibility of, uh, you know, achieving the same impact by, uh, you know, the grid availability issue. Mm -hmm. And right now, the existing PPAs don't really uh, uh, my, uh, compensate you for that. I mean, the state could, uh, I mean, the discom could say that, okay, that, uh, you know, grid is not available. And as of now, it's very difficult for, uh, you know, the generator to uh, prove that that was not the case and get a comp or even if it was, it will be difficult for him under the existing PPAs to uh, get compensation for that. The new uh, draft norms which have been uh, proposed do give compensation but 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 it's not full it's not 100 percent compensation and particularly when we are looking at very large you know capacities where you know let's suppose if uh, you know renewables were to be more than 100 gigawatts at that point of time uh, you know uh, back downs even because of non-technical issue purely because of demand issue will come up and uh, exist even the draft provisions will not possibly fully cover for the loss of revenues so that i see you know addressing that could be a very major challenge i think would be one of the major challenges because you know if uh, like in the case of hydro projects there was to be or thermal days deemed generation clause if a deemed generation clause was there that if there was a loss of revenue because the grid was not available and if payments were not an issue uh, it's really, I mean, re uh, renewables, then it really comes down to whatever is the generation variation in a good year, a bad year. In wind, that number can still be very large. But in solar, that uh, gap between the best year and worst year is actually hardly anything at all. So uh, from that perspective, operating risks, actually, if this demand and payment issue is sorted out, actually for operational projects, it's almost like a bond, as you uh, said in your, uh, you know, opening remarks. It will almost be like a bond, actually. Particularly in the case of solar, not so much for wind. So broadly, that is what I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, address from the risks from an operating angle. From the finance angle, of course, uh, I mean, 
on the forex side of course that is there that uh, historically if you look for a long enough period you know that has varied between 3 to 3 and a half percent and some investors who have a very long term appetite could uh, feel that uh, year on year losses is not something that he's concerned about he's really looking at a 20 year kind of returns for himself now as as to how he still wants to mitigate the year on year risk that really is the prerogative of the individual investor or the developer we can't really commit into that so that is broadly what i would like to address on the this side thank you once again so much uh, sabesh ashu you really really added a lot of perspective on risk specifically into that and i think we are all very enlightened with that now so uh, if somebody has been able to think through uh, a very uh, important question most welcome yes can you introduce yourself and uh, also your organization so that everyone knows some of us know you of course but it will help and if uh, anand the mic may be given there and then you can keep your question brief but keep it directly shoot it towards the person you want it to be addressed by sure uh, good morning i'm um, nishant uh, we are upcoming developers uh, in the dg side of uh, business uh, solar um, rooftop uh, private pps is uh, where we are looking to invest uh, monies into a lot of the discussion that was happening here uh, i believe was under uh, government schemes or large projects i would like to have an understanding on where uh, say financial innovations or um, invests uh, the bonds uh, you know in the foreign market can be put into place or figured out um, into a smaller market size uh, where we do have the the retail aspect associated we are in the business for 50 years and and we we have the sizable coverage across india um so that's something that uh, i would like uh, amit ji um, mukund sir uh, or sanjeev ji to help me have an input on so we'll start in that order uh, so uh, yeah we un understand that everything was revolving more around the utility scale side and larger generation projects but then on the distributed side also there has been kind of groups who have tried to invest into few kind of large institutions if you would have seen last year at least like amplus was trying for one more raise clean max had got financing from warbuck pinkers etc there has been that groups that are invested there but you know other routes that you mentioned like an invit structure or a bond structure the point with rooftop is scalability like those the markets that when you tap a bond market or invit market there has to be enough amount of scale that has to be generated earlier prior to going into like the market so rooftop i agree if someone says it has a 50 megawatt rooftop portfolio it is significant scale but when you look at the quantum of capital that would have gone into a 50 meg uh, 50 megawatt portfolio it would be hardly 50 million dollars now that 50 million dollars is not like large capital enough to go to a bond market or a invit market that's where you know these markets will open up i would not say rooftop and distributed is the space once like in another 3 4 years if storage develops well this is a market which has significant potential in india given that a lot of rural areas do not have enough of electricity so there is no doubt that this segment has to come up but today is is the segment positioned enough to tap these type of markets and i would say there is some time for this market to capture those type of segments but otherwise definitely we agree that over time this can have happen at this point what we see that innovations happening around this sec segment is there is one thing that has happened which has come back come by the world bank sbi type of line which is there for rooftop financing which is very very attractive the there are seki projects which are coming up which are bid out in the rooftop space where there is significant amount of subsidy given by the government if i remember the last year an auction came out like earlier this year there was a crore to one and a half crore type of subsidy per megawatt that you can get out from these type of projects so these are such type of smaller innovations that are happening at this stage to cover the segment and the other market once it achieves significant scale can be easily be tapped and maybe you are going to add points yeah good you can yeah it's a question that often asked of me saying um, you know rooftop seems to be the uh, one of the greatest interest Uh, but to to me today, at least in India, rooftop financing um, is more akin to a personal uh, retail lending market than a corporate commercial market. And the reason I say that is because these are often small players. These are often players without much of a credit history. Uh, it's considered an unacceptable level of risk. 
Uh, in fact, we've discussed this with quite a few other retail players as to why uh, why would you not lend to a rooftop solar project when you're happy to lend for a mobile phone purchase, for example. The reason is a mobile phone purchase is, is a short tenor asset. You know in a short while whether you're getting your money back or not. These are long tenor assets and I think long tenor assets in the retail market is not very comfortable with it, except in the case of autos, they can repurchase the car, or in the case of mortgage, which I think is the, is the safest route. So what is the way forward, right? Again, we look at the international market to see what the way forward is. One, um, till we have a way forward, I think the current model of large players backed by international lines of credit, SBI backed by the World Bank, for example, will, will be the way forward to develop and achieve anywhere near that 40 gigawatt target that we have. But that is going to work only for large, very reputed aggregators. Uh, you know, you either have large corporates that are putting rooftops in place, or you have large uh, aggregators that have a, a good presence today in the field magazines and the amplices and the, uh, if they are the ones who really can, uh, who, will, who will be able to build this kind of capacity. Again, they will be willing to deal only with the corporate institutions. Uh, again, sensible, right? Because in India, residential uh, tariffs are still very concessional. You probably won't be able to comp uh, compete with corporate institutions, uh, large commercial institutions that you can compete with. So that model is going to work very well. SBI, uh, backed by World Bank, lending to big aggregators like Amplus, which in turn do largest projects, 500 kilowatts and above, uh, kilowatts and above with uh, large CNI rates. So that's where I see. Unfortunately, this kind of illusion rooftop, look at what's happening in international markets. In fact, just last week, uh, DB was involved in a transaction where we actually held a large rooftop player in the US do a securitization. Essentially, it took hundreds of PPAs, um, but the size of the financing was as much as $300 million. So it's a very large size financing, but a securitized style financing, we have the technologies in place. We only do that for uh, example for the finance. Uh, the question is, can we do that for, uh, for rooftop also? Tenor is an issue. Uh, securitization markets, I don't think the Indian market can take anything more than two, three years. Even a five, seven year turner is quite out of range. So I think we're still some time away before we can actually the tap and open up for uh, financing for rooftop for the not the large players. Will be some time. Sorry, I know that was a very pessimistic answer. No, no, no. That's that's. I think I think uh, the message Mukund has given is uh, very loud and clear. That you know if uh, if. Uh, solar rooftop as you rightly were addressing. Of course, I think uh, not to hide from this uh, room that solar rooftop is the way to go, of course. We all recognize that. And uh, I remember uh, my engagement with Sanjeev for a very long time. He runs a company which was mentioned here two times, Amplus. Uh, you know, we've been talking a lot and he's evolved into this. So the way to go is actually what Mukund brought out in one of uh, the points that he made was maybe the aggregation. And if you really feel that, you know, you along with some others have come to that stage, maybe you should aggregate yourselves. Or if you can attract that pool of capital to yourselves, you could actually buy out others and then aggregate. The way to go will obviously be to scale up. And that's what's very important. And ro solar rooftop, believe, believe you me, will see a lot of that in any case whether you succeed or somebody else in some corner here in this room or outside this room, the way to go will remain that. So I think clearly there, and he rightly brought out with their illustration also that they have done recently a transaction of $300 million, which is what the size and scale can be, you know, gauged from. So that's, I think, so you're right there. You are focused on one of the best possible niches segment of the market today, and there is no way but for that to go forward. So with that, I think, and Anand standing there, uh, I would uh, probably request you all to join me in giving a great hand to this lovely and most intelligent panel that I have had here with me today. I'm sure you enjoyed as much as I did being with them. So please join me in giving them a great round of appreciation. Thank you. Thank uh, I think we are there all on the lunch. If you allow, maybe. Uh, not to keep everyone else away from the lunch, so we we could probably allow. Yeah, during uh, the lunch time, probably more questions because we are little exceeding the timelines we had set. So, uh, thank.
thank you very much i think indeed uh, very very uh, involving very engaging and uh, very insightful uh, discussions and presentations made by the panelists and um, definitely as the way the sector is go growing and uh, i will just echo one of the small things that uh, sanjeev sir mentioned about grid parity like 8 uh, 9 years ago when we uh, were all uh, starting our solar journeys we were all really excited about uh, grid parity uh, being achieved and now we not only achieved grid parity we are much cheaper solar or wind is much cheaper than conventional sources of energy and uh, all the more the picture today is really not very exciting as it appeared to be although it came out early as well like we were all expecting that grid parity would not come before 2020 or 2022 and uh, it has come very early i think in 2017 so i think the entire mission needs uh, to have a relook lot of emphasis needs to be put on uh, rooftop solar lot of emphasis on micro grids mini grids in villages uh, and i think government is definitely doing its bit uh, new multilateral agencies are doing their own part like world bank sbi deal we have seen we have seen uh, pnb adb deal uh, european investment bank ebrd they're all gearing up to push more and more rooftops uh, in india thank you very much a big round of applause um, and um, a big thank you to all the esteemed panelists uh, i am truly honored and privileged uh, to share this dais Uh, with you all thank you very much i'll uh, further take this opportunity and request our session chair uh, gupta sir to uh, please um, uh, present small uh, gifts to all uh, the speakers on the dais please